Perseverance. I always tell people perseverance is 90% of it. If you just hang on and keep going, you know, in good faith, you know, if you're not in it just to be, just for ego reasons or just to be successful, but if you actually have something that you love to do and you want to do it, just hang on and the things will turn in your favor. I'm here today with Peter Ramsey, who is a director, a producer, and a storyboard artist who is the first black director to direct a big-budget animated film with Rise of the Guardians. He's also the first black director to win the Academy Award in animation for Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. And you can see his most recent work on Netflix as the series director and producer of the show Lost Ali. And you have literally been called the Obama of animation. <laughs> have you not? <laughs> I have to my <laughs> eternal confusion, but yes, yes I'm sure. Well, well, well we're going to talk <laughs> all about that today. First of all, Peter, given the, the pedigree of projects that you work on and the pedigree of people, and we're going to get a lot more into that. Uh, mm. The fact that you're willing to spare 90 minutes of your life and your attention for me and my audience, I'm eternally grateful for that, as I'm sure my audience is as, as well. So thank you so much for being here. Pleasure. It's my pleasure. Uh, so for anybody listening that thinks that we're going to dive deep into the craft of animation and Spider-Verse and Lost Alley or anything else, fair warning, you're listening to the wrong conversation because <laughs> that is not why we're here today. There are plenty of people that have amazing craft conversations of which I know you've been a part of them. What I'm more interested in is origin stories. And I love the origin stories of real people. And you, of course, being in the, the comic book world, the animation world, origin stories are really important, but it's your mm. origin story that I'm so fascinated by because on paper, you frankly have no business being who you are today. And that fascinates <laughs> me, there, right? There are so many different things that happen, some of which are choices you made, some of which are circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, but I love understanding how people become who they become, but more importantly, how they get to the level that you have without having mm -hmm. to step on others along the way and still continue to be nice and help others mm -hmm. to climb that ladder to the top rather than climbing over them to meet your own personal needs. So there's so many things about your story that I want to dive into. Uh, but the, the first one that's the most interesting to me is uh, the fact that you come from essentially right in Los Angeles in South mm -hmm. Central L.A. where Boys in the Hood is almost a documentary film mm -hmm. to you. But you say that Hollywood felt like it was a million miles away. That to me doesn't connect. That doesn't even make yeah. sense. So explain to me how you can be so close yet feel so far away. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you've got to, I think one thing you've got to do is sort of jump in a time machine and, you know, bring yourself to a time when there was no internet, when, uh, you know, movie box office totals and, you know, the machinations of the, of the, of the, uh, entertainment industry, they weren't on the news. You know, there was, it was much more of a separated world. There, there wasn't the same sort of uh, awareness of what went on behind the scenes of uh, the entertainment business as there is now. So it really was, you know, these things popped on TV and you, you'd watch them or you'd, you know, or in my family, we'd go to a movie maybe what, twice a year, which was a, like a big event for us. Uh, you know, as you said, I grew up in South Central. My dad was a mailman. Mom was a uh, uh, an educational aide. And at that time, you could have you could have a house and raise a family on that money. So things have changed. But um, it was it was there was a lot more mystery and a lot less a uh, lot less information available about you know well, how do you work in the movie industry or for me even the idea that real people made movies and TV shows it was like a it was a foreign concept and. You know, the, the other element, of course, is, you know, I was growing up, I was a young black kid. Uh, and, you know, it's a very, very much even way more so than a white dominated industry. Things have changed quite a bit. But back then, you know, the I, I didn't even know I didn't know what a director was, let alone that a black person could be a director, for example, you know, or, or any other job in the, in, in the industry. It was it was literally like. Uh, another a, par a parallel universe. So, um, just to kind of set the stage of the mindset that that I kind of grew up in. That's that's basically what what you had to kind of wrap your head around. 
Yeah, and the the couple of things that I think are important are the geography, but also the identity or the perception. And what I mean by Mm -hmm. that is that for me, I grew up on a a dairy farm in the middle of nowhere in northern Wisconsin. So so to me, Hollywood was a million miles away. I still make the joke to this day that when I go back home, I need a passport because it's like going to a foreign country. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. different, right? And Mm -hmm. movies and TV shows and anything that just magically showed up on the screen, it felt it just fell out of the sky. People don't actually make it it's not a thing it just exists right so anytime that i mentioned that i want to work in hollywood people would always question it's like yeah right like you're just going to stay here and work road construction or you know work in the woods like everybody Mm -hmm. else does but nobody ever questioned whether or not i could do it because of the color of my skin or my upbringing Mm -hmm. so i would imagine that for you geography technically wasn't a challenge but perception would have been like you know boys from the south central they don't work in hollywood very, very much so. And, and, and just to just to piggyback onto that, you know, it never would have entered my mind to think. In fact, it didn't enter my mind to think I could work in the in the with anything having to do with movies or TV until I was pretty much getting into my in my very late teens, almost in my 20s. It's just the, the I know it sounds bizarre to people now, but back then, uh, pre-internet. Uh, it was it was not something that I ever even considered. So when that world started opening up, it was a life changing experience. So let's talk about how did that world slowly start to evolve and open up for you? Yeah, well, I you know I had a group of friends and we were all you know I'd drawn all my life and you know I got into comics and I was watching movies and all along and huge movie fan and uh, as I said you know we'd go to the movies infrequently but when we did it was like a religious experience it, it really was like going to a cathedral and the curtain opens and the this gigantic wave of emotion and sensation just kind of bowling over you just you know it was it was the greatest and and it was like yeah it was like christmas coming like twice a year when we go to, so it was a, it was a big a big deal um so i had a bunch of friends uh, and uh, or a group of friends, you know, we were into comics. You know, we a, a good friend who was a painter. I mean, we like you know do our own comics and we live that stuff. And as we got into our teens, a couple of these guys really started getting into into film, into movies. And I had, you know, the first movie that really got me going as a film goer in my own right was surprise, surprise, Star Wars. So I saw that, I think I was, what, 14 when I saw Star Wars? Just, of course, blew the back of my head off and I completely, completely reset me. And I really started like vacuuming up movies, like going going to see as many as I could. And these friends of mine, you know, a couple of few years older, they were starting to get into slightly more mature films. Like, you know, uh, this was the era when Scorsese and Coppola and, all the great 70s filmmakers, you know, were, you know, it was coming to the end, it was right around the end of the 70s. But it was, uh, it was a, just a great time to go out and experience those movies. And that really started making me aware that, you know, movies, they, they're an art form. There's something about them. There's, this movie is different from that one. Why? You know, this movie, there are these ideas in this movie. And there's a way that this movie looks that's, that's really compelling me more than maybe these other ones do. Why is that? You know, and, and the idea, the idea that people actually made these started becoming something that I was interested in, you know? So, so it was, it was really the beginning of me understanding uh, art period, which I was also beginning to learn about and uh, the, you know, what an artist really does. And uh, um, I think becoming, you know, uh, no, beginning to learn a little bit more about how films are made, how they come together, and how they come together. Uh, I started like wondering, well, God, you know, how do you become part of that? You know, it's, it's it still seemed like this mysterious kind of like priesthood or or a knowable order. And then I actually started meeting a couple of people who were like dabbling in the fringes of it. You know, somebody who'd be like an assistant to a production designer. Or, or even further removed, an assistant researcher to a production designer. So that would be the person who'd go to the bookstore and, you know, I worked at a bookstore and they're 
I, somebody who also worked with me was tasked with like finding the right photography books to, for this art director to use as a reference. Somebody who had worked construction and was doing some, you know, building some sets, things like that. And uh, people nibbling at the edges of the really low budget film world. And uh, it was like, oh my God, I know these people. And they're like, boy, you, you can really do that. And it's, it's one of those weird things. I mean, I, I know that if I had like just asked enough of people in my general circle that other people might have gone, oh, yeah, I know a guy who did this. And oh, yeah, I know a guy who did sound on this or whatever. But it, it just never entered my mind to even think about it. That was how, you know, separate a thing it, it seemed to me. But of course, you know, once the dam kind of started to break all these things started flooding in and I'd, I would end up doing uh, somebody got me a job sweeping up uh, confetti on the set of a Terry Coke commercial. <laughs> and that was like my first time ever on like a real set, which was kind of blew my, it, that kind of blew my mind. Um, I, I did a painting. I did a, a, a mural uh, for uh, uh, an ultra low budget movie that a friend of mine was art directing painted a mural on the back of a gym so i got to be around that for a little bit so bit by bit it was little things like that and then uh i think the thing that really sort of crystallized uh any kind of ambition for me uh was uh i went to see et with my friends and you know i should i i should say you know prior to seeing et you know i'd seen all kinds of other films you name it you know coppola you know terrence malick you know, so I was a, I was a real film buff, and I was learning more and more. But for whatever reason, that particular screening of ET it had just come out, and uh, you know the audience was just in the palm of Spielberg's hands. People were bl completely blown away by the movie. I was swept up in it. Coming out of the theater, uh, there was such an excited buzz, and people were so moved, and everybody had the same emotion coming out of there that I was like, God, it's it's incredible that somebody can make something that does that. And this guy Spielberg did it. And I'd been a fan of close encounters of like, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark, I think, you know, and, but for whatever reason that day, that time, that moment, it finally clicked that people, you can, you can do this. You know, that's something that a person that, that a, a human being can do. And I it inspired me to go, you know, I think I, I think I don't know what I know what I want to do. I think I want to be a director. I really think I want to try. And that kind of set me off on the path. I love that. Uh, before uh, before talking more about the path, the one thing that I find interesting, and I'm sure this has a lot to do with your upbringing. But mm -hmm. if you had been brought up differently in the exact same area, you could have gone to CNET and thought to yourself, this can be done, but not by me. I'm not the kind of person that can do this. So what was it about your upbringing that made you watch ET and say, not only this is a thing that can be done, but I can do it. Well, that's, that's what I, I believe me. I had grown up the whole rest of my life up to that point thinking that, and it wasn't until I ran into a few people that actually were making inroads into the industry. And I think uh, a couple of my friends at that time, uh, had started taking, uh, they were taking a few film filmmaking classes at LA City College, which had, and I think still has, a really good program. And they were really pumped out about, up about that. And I was like, wow, you mean, you're going someplace and they, you get to make films? And it's, it, it just being a, around a few people that were actually making tiny inroads. <laughs> I mean, as an aside, I remember, I remember meeting a friend of a friend and uh, this guy said that he was writing a script. <laughs> and my first impulse was, I just laughed. I was like, what, what are you doing that for? I think I maybe literally, I was, if I didn't say it, I was thinking it. Why are you wasting your time doing that? It was like me saying, I'm building a rocket ship in my backyard. I'm going to go to the moon. That's how unrealistic I thought it was. And he said, no, you know, where do you think the screenplays come from? You know, people, you know, people write them sometimes and get an agent and make a movie. And I was like, what? So it was like, you grew up on a, a dairy farm in Wisconsin. I mean, I might as well have. You know, it really was like that. So as, as far as my upbringing, though, you know, I would, 
uh, I'd say that the other element that that uh, that worked in my favor for me growing up was that my mom you know, always insisted on having a lot of books in the house from when we were really from a really early age. And I remember being, you know, a really young kid and basically plowing through the World Book Encyclopedia. We had a set of encyclopedias that, you know, I don't know how many years I spent going through those out of date things, but just like soaking them, soaking them up. So I was, I was a big reader. I was a voracious reader. I, I, uh, just, you know, really, um, I think my, my view of the world, you know, got shaped by reading early on. So I had a lot of, uh, um, uh, my imagination kind of, really ranged for pretty far and wide, even though, you know, we really rarely, I could count on my fingers the times that uh, we actually went to visit another state or another city or something like that. It was very, very seldom. It was a real, it was a real, like, kind of very basic blue collar upbringing that I had. But within that, you know, uh, movies and, and reading in particular, just really kind of expanded me and my parents, you know, they, uh, they encouraged, they encouraged me doing stuff like drawing or like, you know, all this kind of, you know, I was, I was a kind of, you know, art kid without really knowing anything about art, you know, just my own little, they never discouraged me. They, you know, they always like, you know, do what you want to do, you know, just get good grades, go, you know, be yourself. So I didn't have a lot of built in, uh, um, resistance or prejudice against like being open to new things or, 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 uh, you know, trying new things. For me, it was just a matter of, uh, just a matter of lack of knowledge about the world, about, you know, and my parents certainly didn't know because they had grown up during the depression. They were both depression kids. They both come from really, really poor families. For them, you know, having a house, having a steady job they hit the jackpot. You know, it was just, it's just like, Hey, we're getting by, we're doing okay. There's always food on the table. The kids are good and they're in school. Everything's great. And it was, uh, I never felt that I lacked for anything. I certainly never felt like I was poor. You know, I never felt that. And it was, but my world was circumscribed by, you know, by, uh, by the kind of the limits of what my parents knew. And uh, once I started, of course, you know, growing up and getting a little beyond that is when things really started to click, I guess. Yeah. So the, the short version is that you were clearly instilled with a really solid foundation of morals and values and, you know, hard work and equal success. And um, you could you know, say that you could say that at, at the at the same time. I mean, yeah, there was there was definitely like, you know, just work hard, keep your nose to the grindstone and, you know, you'll get by. There was never. Uh, there was never like, oh, uh, I mean, there was like, oh, it'd be great if you could, you know, be well, rich and successful someday or a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, but there was no practical, there was no practical road to that, that I had at my disposal. Like when, when the time came to apply for colleges and things like that, my parents had never gone to college. They didn't know the first thing about applying or financial aid or, you know, I kind of like had to cobble together on my own you know how to do that stuff they just they would they would have helped if they'd known how they just had no idea it wasn't their world you know so so even the idea and also you know honestly they grew up uh, uh my mom grew up in new orleans uh, during the time of jim crow you know my dad like grew up in baltimore he was like you know the the kid you'd see in an old 30s movie helping the junk man find scrap you know so th for them there was no uh the idea that as a black person, you know, you could, you know, somehow achieve incredible success without being like, you know, a singer or an entertainer or something like that, or, a, you know, or a star athlete, which my, you know, obviously my dad would love that. But uh, not having any of those things, it was like, well, good luck, do as good as you can, <laughs> have a happy life, you know, but you're not going to be, uh, <laughs> it's, it's only going to go so far. Yeah. That was kind of their attitude. You're probably only going to get so far. So it certainly wasn't. We're, we're, we're going to encourage you to pursue a very lucrative career as a Hollywood storyboard artist. Probably no, not a lot no. of those conversations. No, not at all. It was, 
I think complete bafflement as I was starting to do it. They were like, what do you, what do you, you get paid to do what? Mm-hmm. What do you, you're drawing your what? No, that did not, would not have computed for them. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, one of the reasons that it's so important to me to have as much of a diversified audience and diversified voice on the show is that I mm-hmm. really want people that could potentially be in a similar situation yes. now that you may have been 30, 40 years ago. They see your face, 100%. they hear your voice and they believe wait a second, somebody that looks like me and talks like me and has my background has done it, it's possible, right? That's That's really, really important to me. But I don't believe for anyone it's possible to do it by yourself. So I talk over and over about how the quality of your career is dictated by the quality of your network. And frankly, the Mm -hmm. quality of your life is dictated by the quality of your relationships. Mm -hmm. Plenty of science backs up that this is true. Like literally the the Mm -hmm. degree to which you are happy or fulfilled is directly correlated to the quality of your relationships. And I believe the level you attain in your career is dictated by the quality of your network. So yeah. it's one thing to say that you, you know, kind of figured your way through college and you had a propensity mm-hmm. to to be a, an artist or a drawer or a painter and you really admired people like Steven Spielberg. But mm-hmm. allow me for a short second to just dictate the short list of some of your mentors along the way, because when I saw mm-hmm. this on the page, yeah. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. So let me let me yeah. just list this off for our, our listeners and watchers. John Singleton, Francis mm-hmm. Ford Coppola. Ava DuVernay, Steven Spielberg, David Fincher, Robert Zemeckis, Spike Jones. These are not people that inspired you. These are people that hired you and mentored mm-hmm. you to become who you are today. How in the world does that happen? <laughs> uh, honestly, it, it's a good question. Uh, so much of it is just being at the right place at the right time. I mean, seriously, I, I, I guess I, I, I know, I, I think I could probably be a little more, actually, a little more definite, a little more practical about it. This particular skill set that I happen to have, being a storyboard artist, relatively rare. I mean, you've got to, when you, what storyboarding basically is, is being able to, uh, being able to physically draw uh, something that is going to give a visual repre- representation of how a director would approach shooting a scene. So, which means you've got to know film grammar. You've got to be able to uh, draw well enough uh, to realistically depict something, uh, you know, dimensionally in space that looks pretty accurate as far as what you could see through a camera. You've got to have somewhat of a practical knowledge of what it takes to achieve specific shots you've got to have uh, a, a, at least a basic understanding of uh, editing techniques things like that and you've also got to be able to assimilate information that's you know coming from you've got to be able to interpret uh information whether it's coming from a director or from a script page so there's a lot of things you have to a lot of uh skills you sort of have to synthesize and, and bring to the table so working at the at the studio film level it's a relatively small pool of people who can do that reliably and quickly and regularly and i think more than anything else it's it's that that kind of dictated the the people that i got to run into because you know when i i i first got into storyboarding i i uh, the idea had hit me right, pretty soon after i just de- after i saw after i decided i'm going to be a director you know and i was like, okay, well, I've got no money. I can't really make short films because back in those days, you know, 16 millimeter film that had any sort of anything close to professional quality, forget it. You know, I that's thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars that I didn't have. So how could I get in? And, uh, you know, I had spent all this time drawing. I thought I was going to be a comic book artist for a long time, which is also, you know, sequential storytelling. And uh, I'd flip through some of my Star Wars books and I'm like, wait a minute, you know, maybe I could, now that the light bulb's been turned on and I know that I can enter this world somehow, I see storyboards all over the place. Maybe I can try that. I can draw at least that well. I signed on with an agency that rep storyboard artists for commercials, got a grounding in that over a year, working with commercial directors, getting, you know, a real feel for a camera and the basics. And at the end of that year, they got me a job on a movie and uh, it was a non-union movie. It actually never got made, but I had uh, a big stack of samples that I could show around 
And shortly after that, I got onto another non-union movie that uh, went union, and I had the days. So suddenly, I was in the union. Uh, I was like, you know, 24, 25 years old, and uh, just got, you know, once you're if you're in the union and you're on the list, you're gonna get you're gonna get on some big movies, and you you do enough of those, and you you uh, you get. Um, uh, you start to get a reputation. People recommend you to other people. You know, if you have a, if you have a, if you have an ability to create a rapport with a director, and they can rely on you to, you know, kind of interpret what they're thinking or anticipate what they're thinking, uh, you can, you know, you you really start building a reputation, and that's really what happened. I started getting recommended among other people, or. You know, uh, produ- you know, producers, it's the same thing. They'd go, oh, you know, this guy's pretty good. Let's, you know, I, I did this movie with so-and-so. Now I'm doing this with Coppola. Let's see. Let's see if you can plug in here. And honestly, that's how that's how it went. I, it, it was a fairly small talent pool that I was lucky enough to enter at the right time. So you brought up a really interesting word that I talk mm-hmm. about a lot on this show, which is mm-hmm. luck. When you first started the beginning of this conversation, you're like, I was just in the right place at the right time. Actually, let me expand upon that. And I'm glad you Mm -hmm. did because I would have called you out on that. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, oh, Zach doesn't believe that luck exists. And that's not true. But Mm -hmm. I believe that so many people ascribe luck to the reason either why they were successful or Mm -hmm. more importantly, a lot of people use luck as an excuse for why they haven't become successful. Mm -hmm. And I think Mm -hmm. there are certain parts of your story where, yeah, the fact that you were on a non-union project that became union totally out of your control, that was kind of lucky. It was right. It was good to be in that place. But here's the part that was not lucky. And that was the big word you use repeatedly, which is reputation. Mm -hmm. If you weren't that good at what you did, Or more importantly, you weren't the quality of person that you are and you didn't have the quality of interactions that you did. Mm -hmm. Do you think you'd have the list of mentors that you do or the list of credits if you were just an okay storyboard artist that people kind of tolerated working with? No, Uh, no, absolutely not. I mean, and I think, and it's not to say that I'm, you know, I honestly think there are storyboard artists who are, you know, quite a bit better than me. I think what I did, uh, what I did have kind of a, uh, a skill for was uh, the communication aspect of it. I think I was pretty good at that. I think I was, I, I also think I came to it, you know, I, I, I came to it with a real, uh, you know, my, my goal always was to become a director myself. So for me, it was like being in school and I was always, I was like, I was a sponge. I wanted to learn so badly and I wanted to, understand how what these guys did uh, so much and that I think people people can tell the energy you're putting out and they can they can get a feel for what uh, what's driving you I think you know as you interact with them and I think they could just tell like wow this guy's happy to be here he's he's curious uh, he's you know very open to like you know and it was true I, I didn't see it as I didn't see this as a destination I had reached. I saw it as sort of a, 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 a part of the path that I was on. So I, I, the way I came to it was like, you know, a person who was uh, uh, just hoping to grow and hoping to learn more and, 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 uh, and uh, sort of uh, uh, get more, just get more sophisticated and wiser about the craft of it. And I think that just translated into people feeling like they didn't, there wasn't a sense of competition with my ego that way. I wanted to know what they knew. I didn't necessarily care about showing them what I knew because, you know, frankly, I was pretty green, you know, but I think that sort of like beginner attitude actually went a long way in like allowing people to open up to me and, uh, and uh, uh, to work with me in a way that, that that felt good to them because I was I was just eager I was a sponge and I could I could do the work well enough to give them what they needed so it kind of it it was a mutually beneficial thing I think and you know I I it's I was never an ass kisser you know I was never uh, I was I was proud enough that I and 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 oddly not desperate enough that I ever felt like I had to humiliate myself or or prostitute 
prostrate myself in front of anyone, you know, so I could, I, I think that was another part of it for whatever weird reason. And I, I think it's always because I was saying, well, I'm, I'm going to be a director. So I'm not worried about the, you know, the, the petty day to day. I'm, I got my eyes on the prize and I, I, it just gave me a kind of like weird, uh, uh, confidence in the moment that I, I think uh, that put people at ease. You know? Yeah, I think it's, well, that's one of the things that people don't realize about the power of having clarity of your goals yeah. is that you kind of be, you start to feel like the eye in the center of the hurricane where yeah. everybody else is yeah. swept up in all the drama and you're just like, you know, I'll, I'll deal with what I need to deal with. But at the end of the day, this is does not need to be a part of my journey. And I'm just going to keep forging ahead, but not at the expense of others. And it sounds like Correct. you were very clear on where you wanted to go. Yeah. And 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 because I was like, at, while I was working, I was also I was like teaching myself to write. I was still like reading every film book I could get my hands on. I was pretty like, I was like, this is what I want to do. And it was, uh, uh, you know, that idea that, uh, God, it was just in my head. And I was going, just this, just the feeling of, um, oh, yeah, that feeling not so much that I've arrived, so I have to defend my territory, but I'm the, the you know, the real goal is out there. So I'm not being over invested on where I was at the time. I think it was a huge thing for me was a really big thing that I never really, yeah, I think it's only in, only in the past few years that I've kind of understood that was part of my mindset. And I'm, you know, I think I always chalked it up to being kind of scatterbrained or sort of like, you know, kind of, uh, kind of dreamy or, or like, I always, I, I remember, I remember, <laughs> I remember I was talking to someone, I think it was like a producer or somebody. And uh, we were talking, and, I said, and they were asking me, oh, what are you doing next? And I was like, I don't know. I'm kind of a leaf on the wind. I'm like, you know. And they kind of like, yeah, I kind of see you that way, actually. You know? Because I was kind of like this, had this la-di-da, you know. Oh, we'll see what happens. I'm, I'm, I'm going this direction, but hopefully some surprises will happen. And I'm, you know, I'm working on my own little things. And, you know, hopefully something will happen. But it was that that kind of mindset that I was like, I don't know. It, it's It's a... It's a really, when I think about it now, it's a really strange, it feels like a really strange thing. But I think enough good things were happening to me that I was like, oh, things will be fine in the end. I just had this weird, dumb optimism. Yeah, and I, I think that uh, it's great optimism. I don't think there's anything weird or dumb about it, but there's certainly a paradox between I know exactly the direction I'm headed and I'm also simultaneously a leaf in the wind. Yeah, But that's kind yeah. of sort of what it takes, because if you think that the success path is this straight line and it, with any deviation, yeah. it means that you failed or it's not going to happen. It's different versus Ooh. I know the destination is here. I'm OK if the path. Yep. Kind of. Oh, no. Here we go. Right. Like that's kind of how it works. You have to be willing to embrace that. Yeah. And I think I think I had also I'd also by that point, I'd had enough setbacks or like reversals that I knew that, oh, okay, you're not, it's not going to happen overnight. You know, something, something great would happen. Like, you know, oh, who knows, whatever, whatever it could be, you know, wow, this is, this is absolutely fantastic. And then you kind of settle down and read the fine print and it's like, oh, wait a minute. It's actually not as cut and dried as I thought, or, you know, who knows, you know, but there's, there's always setbacks. And once you've encountered a few of those, but, you know, but you got another job after that. Or you realize, oh, it wasn't as bad as I thought, and I'm, my life's not over because this thing didn't go right. Or, you know, what, whatever it was that I, I guess I started to develop this instinct for, you know, yeah, you can kind of like screw up or have a setback and still keep going. And that really, I think, became the real lesson was like, you know, if you just hold on and have, your, have some you know, some kind of goal in mind and just keep going, the wheel's going to come back around. You know, there's, you might feel like you're the unluckiest person in the world. And there are several times in my career that I did because things happened that were like, you got to be kidding me. And it felt like, wow, how do I come back from this? And I did, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it's perseverance. I always tell people perseverance is, 90 percent of it if you just hang on and keep going you know in good faith you know if you're not in it just to be 
just for ego reasons or just to be successful. But if you actually have something that you love to do and you want to do it, just hang on and the things will turn in your favor. Yeah, I think all that's amazing advice. And I could break this down into 17 different parts and four different episodes. Mm. And I'm going to break it down to two things that I think are really vital. Uh, Mm. One of them is this conversation about mindset, which to me is so Mm -hmm. vital to success. I love talking about mindset. People want to talk about crafts and skills and whatever. Like, okay, that's fine. Mindset is absolutely key. And there's a mindset that I think that you shared kind of sort of that I want to dig into deeper that I think is the Mm -hmm. core of so many reasons why you're successful. And you said earlier in your career, I was really approaching it like a beginner. But something Mm -hmm. tells me that hasn't changed at all. Because right on Twitter, it says, Oscar winner, complete and total beginner. That makes no sense. If there's anybody that feels like they have arrived and they have the authority to use their ego to get what they want, Shouldn't it be the Black Obama of uh, animation? Like, <laughs> why, why, why can't you just dictate your terms? How could you possibly consider yourself a beginner? You know, there's, there's, there's so much I don't know. I mean, plain and simple. There's like, I know that there's there is a ton of stuff that I do not know. Uh, it's also, uh, I think having a, having a respect for the for for the craft that I'm, you know happen to be a part of and you know this you know you work in you work in film and it's like it's infinite you know nobody could ever know everything about you know making film or the the i mean there's it's it's such a vast art form that to ever think that you know your that that your expertise can't get any you know more developed or that you know everything there it's ridiculous it's it's totally infinite and uh so it's it's i i think once you stop once you once you give up that idea that you know at some point you're going to know everything or at some point you're going to really you're going to really feel like an expert or that you need to be an expert about everything you know once you i'll tell you another you, you talked about you talked about my mentors and i don't know that i'd ever call any of those guys you know intentional mentors but you know, the effect of what, what our relationship was, was, you know, yeah, I, I, I got mentored by them. You know, they, we would have exchanges of, or, or, or I'd benefit from their knowledge or I, you know, sometimes I'd literally ask them things and they, but mostly it was just working with them and benefiting from their knowledge. Uh, a couple of people literally took me under their wing in different ways. You know, Francis Coppola, when I worked on Dracula really saw that, you know, wow, this kid is really into this and, and uh, really wants to be a filmmaker. And he'd actively like, you know, do things to sort of like bring me into the process more or, you know, we had, we had some great talks. He was extremely inspiring. Uh, John Singleton gave, and John's actually a few years younger than me, but he had landed in this like plum spot where he was, talk about a guy who was at the right place at the right time. He had the right story to tell. Uh, he was, he had the guts and the passion and the knowledge to be able to, you know, to like attack the system. And, uh, he was great about bringing other people along on a journey. You know, he did, he did great things for me in the course of my career that, you know, served as kind of a mentorship. But, um, I think, uh, you know, that, that kind of, that kind of uh benefiting from from what other people uh had to offer that way was just uh you know it's it's invaluable and it's just it's the uh, oh i you know the point i was really going to (laughs) make is funnily enough they mentored me in another way in that i saw that i could see that they were human beings i got to spend enough time with these guys over the course of making a movie to see them make mistakes, you know, sometimes big mistakes to see them absolutely, uh, absolutely lost, you know, with some things I'd see, you know, I'd see them as very human people. And I was like, Oh my God, you know, David Fincher doesn't always have the answer. What? That's incredible. That's not what his press releases say, you know? And I, you'd see them like have to, you know, they'd see them make a decision, make a decision didn't go well it's a disaster and they'd have to pick themselves up and go you know what new decision we're going 180 degrees in the other direction let's go you know and they just dust themselves off and keep going 
So that was that was also a big one for me. That like it's not magic. It's not something that that you figure out immediately because you're a genius and everything turns out right. It's trial and error, even for those guys. And you know, letting go of this idea that everything always had to be perfect, it takes so much like so much of the stress off of you, you know, it it it, it also allows you to rely on uh, the people around you, you know, your team, you know, your editor, your DP, you know, whoever else, you know, your production designer, all these people around you who are going to have incredible ideas and are all doing their, you know, absolute best and who are all gifted artists, you know, and probably would be great directors in their own rights, you know, but it's like you, you learn to sort of, uh, uh, you learn to collaborate is what you learn to do and to really collaborate with other artists and like try to subsume your ego to the needs of the story and the project. I know I'm getting completely long winded. I apologize. No, no, this, are you kidding? A stream I, of consciousness kind of. There, there's a reason I'm not interrupting you. It's because all this is incredibly valuable. Uh-huh. Um, I think that there's a, a realization that you came to that I came to very similarly, even though our backgrounds could not be more different. They're very, mm-hmm. very similar in relation yeah. to this industry. But yeah. it was when I realized that those that are at the top of their game are not the select anointed few Mm -hmm. that have this God-given talent that only they possess and they're in a a totally select different category. It's like you said, Mm -hmm. it's when I realized like, oh, you kind of have shitty days and you kind of don't know everything that you're doing and you're just approaching this with that other mindset I wanted to talk about, which is perseverance Mm -hmm. and the willingness to work through these challenges and just see them as learning experiences and not say, well, I failed, so I guess Mm -hmm. I'm a failure versus this was a failed experiment or strategy. Now it's time to find something different, which brings me to what happened to you with your first feature film. Mm, Because I believe that you had all the reason in the world to say, well, I tried, that didn't work out, but I guess (laughs) this isn't meant for me and it doesn't Mm -hmm. want me here. So mm-hmm. let's talk about what would essentially made it maybe not the the biggest failure of your career, but at least the biggest failure as far as what we have ever seen publicly. So let's mm-hmm. tell the story of your first feature film. Yeah. Wow. Oh boy. Rise of the Guardians. That was uh, uh, DreamWorks Animation. Uh, I had been at DreamWorks uh, for I guess before I got the job, like four years maybe. Is that right? Four or five years. <laughs> Yeah, but around close to five years, and I had I had uh, came came there as a story artist. I had uh, just a preamble of how I got to DreamWorks. Uh, I I did storyboards and directed a second unit on a movie called Tank Girl. And Tank Girl was produced by a guy named Aaron Warner, who's a wonderful guy. And uh, you know, we struck up a relationship based on you know what I was doing on Tank Girl. Uh, it was a, you know, like a, it was a pretty good sized second unit, you know, a lot of explosions and kangaroo men jumping around and all this cool stuff. So a few years later, I get a call from Aaron, who is at DreamWorks Animation, which was then a fledgling operation, and they were just cranking up on the first Shrek movie. And, uh, you know, he asked me if I'd be interested in coming over there and doing some work on it. And at the time, I think I was storyboarding probably Fight Club or like being John Malkovich or something like that. I was like, well, animation's cute, but I'm working on, you know, a big a big kids movie. So thanks, but no thanks. I was still firmly, you know, live action for me. And, uh, you know, he understood, you know, and I, in the interim, CG animation just exploded and became this whole this really like. Uh, vital kind of form in its in its own right, and like you you know the the movies uh, Pixar was just starting up, and DreamWorks was in, was in its heyday. And uh, a couple of years later, he gave me another call. I think the third Trek movie was starting up. This Trek Two had won Oscars. I you know I'd seen it and really dug it. And and he said, Hey, I I, I want to call and try to entice you over here again. I think with your skill set, you know, you'd be a, a you'd be great here. It's a really he said something that really like got my mind going. He said it's a really pure form of cinema, which was really interesting to me. And uh, he was also like, you know, I, he knew me from directing the second unit on Tanker. And he's like, I think it would, you'd be a great shot to direct here as well. So I tried it out. And uh, DreamWorks was, uh, it was just a lovely place to, to work. The people were great. It, they really respected the art and the artists. And I was like, yeah, I'll try this for a while. And they started like giving me opportunities there. 
And that kind of culminated in me being offered, uh, after doing a couple of other projects, and me being offered uh, the, the movie Rise of the Guardians, which was they, they'd been having trouble getting the story together with the first creative team they had, and they were cha- they were making a switch, and they asked me to come in, come on as director. So it was sort of like, wow, putting me in the game, and the train was already moving because some things about, you know, there were some designs that had already been done, but the story essentially was being scrapped, and we had to start over over from scratch. And I kind of got plugged into it with, uh, you know, my the producer Christina Steinberg had been on the previous version, and but we had a, a, the writer David Lindsay Bear had won like a Pulitzer Prize for a play that he wrote, and it was sort of like I was kind of coming in as the junior partner, you know, and uh, uh, but it was for the most part it was a fantastic experience. It was a, a big adjustment and. Uh, it was a, a big, uh, a really big lesson in learning to work at a studio, you know, particularly like DreamWorks was at the time, you know, you're, it's this vast mach- machine that you sort of have to learn how it works. And, you know, you know, I was kind of green. So it was a, that, that part of it was a little tough, but man, the experience of working with the movie, working with the artists and, you know, the, the whole team uh, directing the actors. You know, we had an incredible cast: Alec Baldwin and Chris Pine, and, and uh, Isla Fisher and Hugh Jackman, and uh, um, Jude Law was our bad guy. So it was like, you know, and uh, I think, uh, you know, as the movie was getting closer and closer to completion, we were screening it, and it was getting amazing test screenings. You know, we'd screen it, and people would be crying, and they'd come up after the screening and you know, thank you for giving my childhood back. It's so magical and wonderful. And, and, uh, it was, you know, we were, we were, people were like starting to get really excited about it. It had gone from this problem child to this thing that was testing really great. And, uh, the studio was, was really high on it. And, you know, they were talking about awards and all this stuff. And I was like, it can't be that. I mean, yeah, I've been working hard on it, but my God, come on! It can't really happen that way, can it? And we were tr- we were all trying really hard to make it something special, and uh, <laughs> so so the thing gets released, and you know we, we've been getting pumped up with all this stuff about how much money it's gonna it's gonna make a billion dollars. It's gonna do this. It's gonna do oh God, it's gonna run. And the movie comes out, and. Uh, the first week it's out, I think it's like the weekend before Thanksgiving 2012. And, you know, Hurricane Sandy's hit on the East Coast. OK, so that was one thing. Oh, well, OK, we're like getting a little more conservative about the numbers because, the, you know, the East Coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. And then it's like, oh, well, you know, it's the, the second, the you know, the week before this, both Skyfall and the new Twilight sequel opened. And those things were like exploding like way beyond anything anybody thought we're like okay well we're still an animated movie and and man we came out and our first weekend was so was really far beyond below what what um what the expectations were and it was it was partially i think there were long story short a lot of things have to go right for a movie to become a, a big success first of all the movie has to be you know really good Second of all, you've got to have a great marketing campaign to make pe- make people aware that the movie's there. We didn't really have that. And third, there's got to be stuff like, well, who's your competition? You know, what's the what else is going on? And we the these other movies were so dominating the marketplace. And you know, this was also a period where animated movies suddenly the competition for them wasn't just other animated movies. It was becoming PG-13 giant movies, which, you know, if you're a parent and you're, you've got to make the choice, okay, I'm going to go to the movies with my, with my kid. It's going to be this much for the movies, this much for the popcorn, this much part. You're out a hundred bucks. Which one am I going to go see? The one that I kind of want to see too, or the one that I want to see, you know? So there were all these elements that just kind of conspired to like, you know, kind of like drive our movie like into like like kind of into the ground a little bit on the theatrical release, and it was this huge thing because, you know, uh, uh, DreamWorks 
animation also kind of occupied this place where, you know, we weren't Pixar. Uh, you know, Jeffrey Katzenberg, God bless him, you know, had this kind of antagonistic relationship with a lot of the animation industry. And uh, a lot of people were, were really salivating over the prospect of him failing. So when the movie didn't open very well, the press was just like on it, you know. And the crazy thing was, you know, we were getting reviewed very, really well. You know, the movie, you know, if I could go back in time and change some things about the movie, yeah, I would. You know, I'd give it, yeah, it's like, a, you know, to be, be, you know. But uh, it was reviewed really well. And I think even, I think a lot of people, uh, uh, even in the press were like, wow, you know, it's too bad what's happening to this movie, you know, uh, out in the marketplace. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't really deserve that. So long story short, uh, you know, you wake up the, the weekend after your movie that you've been working on for three years, uh, kind of killing yourself. And uh, the, the headlines you see in the trades are like, Epic flop. <laughs> DreamWorks, DreamWorks, uh, you know, bomb opening, and you know, and we're, you know, we're like, oh, we're all shattered. We're devastated. You know, and there's all the, you know, crazy phone calls and what happened and what is what's the promo campaign and can we switch the ads? And but it was just we had just run into this like uh, weird brick wall of bad luck, you know. And the movie eventually, you know. It eventually cracked, you know, $100 million in the U.S. And it made like, you know, looking now at what movies make now, it's like, oh, well, it actually did pretty damn good, you know. But back then, when you were up against you know, Pixar mo movies making, you know, you know, a, a half billion dollars or a billion dollars or and with what had been projected for this one, it was like a total reversal of fortune. So it was a real... Uh, shock to the system, you know, and uh, it had implications for the company. But more importantly, to me, <laughs> it was like, oh, my God, am I ever going to be able to direct another movie again after this? And it was and and this is the crazy thing where the, the thing that I said way at the beginning about not over not over investing in your identity as what you're doing, I think, helped because you know, given the result of what happened, I think, you know, yeah, a lot of people might have like, forget it. I'm never going to work again. I quit. I'm out of this. I can't take the humiliation of seeing my name in the same paragraph as Epic Flop. You know, there's a lot of, uh, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of paths I could have taken, but, but I'd seen that I'd, I'd seen a lot of people that loved the movie and that had really been moved and touched by it, you know? So it's like, okay, well, I know it's, I know it's not all about me being an idiot or the movie being that terrible. So let's put that to the side. Yeah. Uh, uh, are you familiar with the idea of the fixed mindset versus the growth mindset? No. no. Okay. The, you, you are, you embody the idea of a growth mindset. I just don't think you're aware of it. And I think it's something oh, you'd be wow. fascinated by. Uh, it comes more from the, the education world than it does from the entertainment world. But, yeah. um, if you, if you're looking for, you know, entertainment with all the free time, I'm assuming that you have in your life and you're looking for a book <laughs> to sit down that you might find fascinating. It's called Mindset. Uh, it's Ooh, by Carol Dweck. Cool. She literally created an entire field of psychology wow. and science behind mindset. Um, but it's it's so funny. You and I are on the that same wavelength because I was just going to interject with my question saying, you know, yeah. it's funny because I want to go back to what you said in the very beginning of identity. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And there, you had two you had two choices at the, the day after the epic failure. Mm -hmm. Choice one is I am a failure. That is my mm -hmm. identity. I am a failed director. Not only that. But I've proven to everybody that black people can't direct animated films because mm -hmm. I was the first and I mm -hmm. failed. So there's a yeah. whole lot of weight there versus yeah. this was a failure and I can yeah. focus on the choices that I made. And I'm proud of many of them. And looking back, you know, you didn't make yeah. A plus choices, but you made good enough choices. And you realized mm -hmm. there are a lot of aspects outside of my control yes. that don't need to dictate the identity that I assume as a failure versus I failed. And Correct. my guess is if we could choose one pivotal, I call them sliding doors moments from like the, the Gwyneth Paltrow 90s yeah. movie sliding mm -hmm. doors where you had these two diverging universes. And I think that to me, without knowing all of the, the moments in between, but if we look at Rise of the Guardians to suddenly becoming an overnight success with the Spider-Verse, 
My guess yeah. is one of the pivotal sliding doors moments was the difference between I'm a failure versus I failed. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's not to say that I, you know, I didn't have, you know, a few moments where like, wow, I, you know, that I for a moment would flirt with the idea of, wow, I think it was more of a question of, am I a failure? Is this it? Did I just hit the, but I never really believed it. You know, I never really believed it because, 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 you know, because of the people I worked with, you know, I know what we put into that movie and I know, you know, I knew the, the, uh, the, the, I was going to say good faith, not just good faith, but like, you know, good, good, strong ideas. Um, I know, you know, and beyond that, I knew like, well, my family, you know, I, my family lo- loves me. <laughs> you know, my friends, like I've got family. I've got, I've got this whole other life. I'm not a, yeah, it's, you know, it, it's, it's, there were, there were too many, too many other things about, you know, my reality that, that didn't lend themselves to the idea that, you know, you are a failure in this, you know, that I, that I just had to sort of go, you know, it's it's like, just like the luck that got me into the job in the first place. It's like, well, some, you know, it cuts both ways. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, you know, you have to be able to swallow, uh, swallow that to, to, uh, to a degree. And, and, uh, you know, uh, also accepting that well is there going to be fallout sure you know you're not gonna you're not gonna have the sort of like uh uh the the a lot of the doors that you thought were going to be wide open the day before the thing opened and that was literally the case a lot of those doors aren't are suddenly going to be you know kind of closed now you know and it's a it's like you have to deal with actual repercussions but you know, the idea that it's 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 really some judgment on your value as, you know, a person or a creator or an artist or whatever, and that that's irrevocable or irrevocable, that that's something that I never internalized or never felt so strongly that I wanted to withdraw from everything. Yeah. So one of the things that I want to dig into even deeper now is we've talked a lot about this moment, uh, kind of a, a pivotal moment in your career where mm-hmm. you had a pretty epic public failure. Mm-hmm. Right. And at the end of the day, I actually it sounds like very little, if none of it had to do with you. It's just a lot of outside forces. And there, there's so many things to consider. And yes, you're a part of it, but it's not like all of the forces aligned that you made a really crappy movie. Right. The, the movie's got a pretty big sure. cult following. And, yeah. you know. So, I mean, I will say if it if maybe if, if the movie had who knows if the movie had been ten percent you know twenty percent better and I think it definitely could have, it might have uh, mitigated all those other factors you know, and I'd be he'd be interviewing me in a room made out of solid gold you know who knows? sure well and we, we but, might still be we might still be doing that given the the trajectory that you've been on, <laughs> um, but uh, having said that I think it's. Uh, it, Going back to this idea of a fixed versus a growth mindset, another way for somebody with a fixed mindset to look at it is, well, pff, none of this was my fault. I don't oh, have to yeah. change anything, yeah, right. right? Right. So right. none of this had to do with me, but you're finding Correct. that nice balance of yeah. I failed, but I'm not a failure. But that also means yeah. there are areas where I can learn and grow for and get sure. better and persevere, right? But 100%. Yeah. what we've talked so talked about so far with this instance are all of the outside voices, the mm-hmm. world, the studios, the mm-hmm. networks, the press, their voices saying mm-hmm. this was a failure or a flop mm-hmm. or whatever it is that they mm-hmm. might have said. But I really right. want to talk about the inner voices and the sense of imposter syndrome, because I would imagine oh, yeah. that either up until this point Ooh. or before it, given your list of mentors, how do you not just walk into a room and say, I don't deserve to be here? But I do, I, all the time. I have terrible imposter syndrome. I always feel that. You know what? I, one day, working on Dracula, back to mentorship, back to Francis Coppola, that was one of the questions I asked him. Like, Francis, you know, because I'd see him, like, working. I, another constant with all these guys, they work really, really hard. And Francis was absolutely no exception. And one day I asked him, Francis, God, how do you deal with how do you deal with doubt? You know, I really battle it. I, I really struggle it. And, and do you ever feel that? And he goes every day, every single day. And he's, he's just like, you just have to, you know, accept that it's there and, and, uh, try not to listen to that voice to the exclusion, to the exclusion of the other things that are, you know, that you know, you're good at and that are pushing you forward. And like, you know, but it was like, 
just him telling me that he felt that himself was huge, obviously, that it's like, okay, I'm not alone in that. You know, and I've talked to so many people who are like, oh, yeah, I get it really bad. You just have to, you know, you have to find a way to push on through somehow. But, yeah, I, I struggle with it constantly. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> which which brings us back to this idea that you start to meet your heroes and get to know them and realize yeah. they've got all the same problems that That's I do. Right. They're not some selective genius that has no issues and they're the special anointed person, which yeah. is again why I think such a key mindset and a core part of your identity in a good way is that you see yourself as an eternal beginner. I, you were reading minds again because I was just going to say that's the whole beginner thing to me because it's like, you know, you think of people you run into that think that actually do think they do have it all figured out, you know, and those are the biggest blockheads. You know, those are the people not to listen to. That's like that's almost like to me, that's like, you know, human being 101 that like the guy who thinks he knows everything is the guy who absolutely does not know everything or the woman or whatever. You know, so that always was that that <laughs> I'm always looking askance at people who are you know, claim to be really certain about things. I'm like, okay, well, yeah. well, let's talk in six months. <laughs> Are you familiar with something called the Dunning-Kruger effect? Oh, yes. So what Absolutely. we're talking about is the Dunning-Kruger effect. Yes. And I might, uh, I might yeah. uh, butcher it a little bit, but just for anybody not familiar, essentially it's this idea that there's a, an inverse correlation between how much you get to know something versus your perception of how much you know it. So when you know nothing about something, you know that you know nothing about something. Mm -hmm. As you start to learn a little bit about it, you have an inflated perception of what you really know, mm -hmm. but then the more you really get good at something, the more you realize, I know absolutely nothing about this subject right. and I never will, which is why the people at the top of their game, like yourself, say, I have so much to learn. The problem mm -hmm. is the people that get stuck in the middle of that curve <laughs> yeah. where they actually don't know that much, but they think they know everything. Yeah. And yeah. my philosophy is that the biggest impediment to great stories and success in Hollywood is not budgets or even schedules. These are things impediments uh, in mm -hmm. my mind to work life balance and having a more fulfilling, sustainable path. But mm -hmm. I think ego and the fact that I know it all and I'm right, that's what gets in the way oh, of great yeah. storytelling more than anything else. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so I think that or what I've, you know, what I've come to so far and, you know, my learning about it, and you know, again, you, you know, never know everything, but you do really do uh, get to the point uh, that you, un you start to understand, well, it's the story that that is the real king, you know, that's you have to subsume uh, a lot of times you have to subsume your own personal taste to w what's going to work best for the story. You know, and when you're collaborating with other people, sometimes, many times, someone will have a solution to something that's, you know, I never in a thousand years would have come up with, but it's actually perfect for the story. And that, you know, not only does it work for the story, it also helps me to sort of like add another like, you know, little brain convolution to to my to my own way of thinking about things. It's like, God, I would never have. But the reason that works is X, Y and Z. And if I know that, that just improves me as a storyteller. So, yeah, it, and that, it pays one, to be of, open. one of my foundational, and now it's an absolutely required rule. And when you're younger in your career, hard to mm -hmm. just have hard and fast rules. But now, given where I am in my career, I have a hard and mm -hmm. fast rule that if you're in my edit suite, the best idea wins. Yeah. I do not care who it comes from. I always tell yep. my students if a janitor's walking by at 9 p.m. and they poke their head and they're like, I think the close-up would be better, and they're right. I'm going to mm -hmm. do it, but That's I work it. with. I've worked with so many people in the past where either I or somebody else in the room had an idea that everybody thought was better, mm -hmm. because this person was in charge and it wasn't their idea, and they couldn't take credit for it. It couldn't be implemented, and I have mm -hmm. no patience for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's the death of uh, the death of real creativity is uh, being stuck in your own ego. You can't. You just. That cl that closes everything off because that's about fear, you know. And if you're afraid, you can't really be fully as fully creative as you as you might. As and it's not just be. about fear. I think the the even deeper thing that a lot of people don't realize, especially when they're working with people at a higher level, is mm -hmm. that it comes from a place of intense insecurity. Yeah. And once yeah. you realize that, it's easier to understand that it's not about you and it's about them. And it doesn't yes. make an environment any less toxic or 100%. whatever the problems might be. But you realize, mm -hmm. oh, they're not attacking me. They're just so incredibly insecure. 
Yeah, they're they're literally afraid of that their own expertise isn't going to be recognized as as what they think it should be recognized as, you know. Right. But then you work, you know, when you work with real like, you know, actual like people, you could say, wow, I think that guy's a genius. You know, you're working with a David Fincher or a Coppola or, or you know, Spike Jones or, you know, guys up in that stratosphere. You see how they can assimilate and kind of like synthesize other people's ideas and like how open they are to other people's contributions you know and, and it's like well yeah I, I see the quality of their work because of the way these guys work yeah and this kind of just brings me full circle to this much grander hypothesis that i have um and there are other people in under other industries behavioral psychologists that are mm. trying to prove this more on a scientific level and i'm just trying to prove it a little bit mm. more on an anecdotal level but i think the the common thinking would be, and we kind of started with this, is thinking, oh, well, well, Peter got to where he is despite the fact that he's so nice and pleasant. And my mm -hmm. hypothesis is that you got to where you are because you are nice and you are pleasant and you respect people because as you are nice and pleasant and you realize that the best idea wins and I want to collaborate and surround myself with people that know more than I do because I don't know anything and mm -hmm. I want to surround myself with the people that fill those knowledge gaps, that tells the best story which then earns the best money or box office or viewers or anything else. And mm -hmm. I just, I'm so tired of this idea that in order to be successful at the highest levels in this industry, you have to step yeah. on people along the way. Yeah, no, I, I think, uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think, I think that just gets born out of, you know, people who are, you know, again, insecurity, you know, you, people have to know the idea is yours. So you have to elbow your way to the, front of the pack somehow or you're you know you're so you're so desperate to get to the top that you're you know not going to credit someone else or you're gonna you know whatever that is uh and it's it's i yeah it's i think it's a, a, a i think it's a lot of it's temperament it a lot a lot of it does come down to the kind of person you are you know i've never been one to like i'm i'm, I'm a live and let live <laughs> kind of a person you know so i I, I I really don't like the idea of mistreating other people or or, or uh, kind of stealing credit from other people, things like that. Uh, it's it's yeah, I, I it's it never it never it never entered my mind that I could do it on my own completely. You know, once I once you once you get a, a feel for the enormity of the job and for the complexity of what it is. Well, it's like, well, yeah, no wonder you need a, a whole crew of people. You know, you absolutely, it's an absolute necessity and the diversity of thought and, and approaches is just, is just going to make something better. But it's like, you know, I don't want to be cooped up uh, with people who have resentment or bad feelings toward each other. Why would I want that? You know, we're so lucky to be able to do what we do. Why not enjoy it and have a, you know, a good time and make it as like pleasant and, uh, uh, pleasant and 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 collaborative as possible so so that so that everybody brings their best game that's the, that's the other thing about it you know the more open i am the more willing other people are to like be open and to you know to really invest themselves in the project in a way that is going to give you the best results because people are putting their hearts and souls into it you know i i've worked and i've worked on enough things where i've just done it for the paycheck and where my, you know, where I was only, you know, a wrist and, or I've had enough jobs, which is the other thing. I've had enough jobs outside the industry where I was just, you know, where it was just drudgery, you know, and where, where it was just day in, day out with no, no real feeling of uh, achievement or like, you know, you, I mean, you know, you work in retail, man, that's like, talk about whew, soul sucking, you know, and the thought that, the thought that, I could work in something that was creative and wouldn't have anything like that feeling to it. To me, it's like, well, yeah, that's what I, I want to be. The, I want to be on the fun train. I don't want to be on the, the miserable train. You know, why would we ever infect what we do with with this kind of horrible mindset where not everyone is welcome to the party? So for me, it's it's you just you get a better result. Everybody's happier. And so why wouldn't you do it this way? Yeah, I couldn't agree with all of that more. And one of the areas that you brought up uh, that was important, uh, just kind of in passing that I think now we just want to hit head on before we run out of time is this mm. idea of diversified voices. 
Mm-hmm. And I know that you're somebody that is very much a champion for bringing more diversity to this industry. Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. clearly this conversation has changed a lot in the last three to five mm-hmm. years. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're, we're working on solutions to the problem. Mm-hmm. I don't think we have solutions to all mm-hmm. those problems. Uh, but I think one of the challenges that's just an ongoing one that I'm sure you can speak to a lot more than I can, because I'm the last person that should have a voice in diversity right now, but I want to oh. champion it. Um, so I think that one of the, the stumbling blocks that so many people people have is, of course, we want to to champion diversity and new voices, but we also want to work with people that have all the experience that have right. worked together before that all collectively know each other. And we don't we don't want to ruin that. So, yeah. like, yeah. how do we just bring people up that don't have the experience? I just want to hire the most skilled worker. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And that that's that's a real stumbling block because the people that could bring the most diversified voices don't necessarily mm-hmm. have mm-hmm. the experience because they never were given the opportunities very early yeah. in their career to climb yeah. the ladder where they can work with you. So I know you're really embroiled in this conversation. So yeah. help us better understand how do we bring more diversified and skilled voices yeah. into the industry without having to lean on. Well, I've worked with them before. I know them. Yeah. Yeah, it's a tough one, because, and and I I understand it very well. I mean, the industry is is very social, you know, and and when you're working on a when you're working that intensely on on a project with people, you know, uh, having a short having an already established shorthand is so valuable that you know, um, yeah, it's 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 a it's a tough problem, but I think it's got to you know it's got to start with. Uh, with people actively trying to do something about it. And that's, to my mind, that's, you know, the number one step is getting past the idea that, uh, that, uh, that you're pandering to to people or that you're, uh, that you're, um, that you're virtue signaling or that you're, you know, any of these things that make it feel like, well, you don't really mean what you're doing. You're, you, you know, you just kind of, you know, you're, you just want to look good yourself and, you know, you know, yeah, obviously we don't want that. But a lot of times fear of that, fear of being accused of that keeps people from even, even stepping foot into the, into the effort, you know? So for me, it's like the first thing is, you know, recognize there actually is, you know, there actually isn't a real imbalance. You know, there actually is a situation where you've got, you know, uh, you've got a lot of people who are who have been shut out of the creative conversation for a long time, and that that has you know it's actively warped the fabric of society by making a lot of people you know not only feel that their that their voice doesn't count, but also by robbing you know uh, you know the majority culture of of the idea that there's actually that the world is actually more complex than they've been taught, you know, that there's so much that, that our popular culture has, you know, in a lot of ways kept, you know, it's obviously, obviously it's really changing recently, which is, which is a good thing. It's not always an easy thing, but it's a good thing. Uh, But there's, there's so, so much of, you know, what happens in politics, what happens in, you know, culture, you name it, you know, is inflected by the fact that popular culture presents uh, an image of of what we think society is and for a long time that image has just been really 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 limited so i think step one is just saying yeah that act you you know you got me it's true it's a problem that needs to be fixed and then it's not looking at the solutions as punitive or or unfair in themselves you know, because a lot will, you know, just, you know, well, something's, I mean, basically, you know, is, is something going to get taken from me if <laughs> these other people get something? And it's like, well, no, that's definitely not the intention, number one. It shouldn't be punitive. Number two, it's like a little patience, please, while this gets figured out. You know, it may feel like that for a little bit. You may look in variety and see like, Jesus, there's five black dudes and three, you know, you know, Asian women who are getting directing deals. What about mine? You know, I want to direct the movie too. And it's like, yeah, I feel you, dude. I'd like, you know, but I just have to say, can we look, turn the lens back on the last 80 years and look at the reverse perspective? I offer my own story, you know? I mean, I didn't get, I really didn't get to direct, a, a, you know, a big movie till I was almost 50, you know? If I had been, you know, 
of, you know, a white kid growing up in, uh, you know, Brentwood, you know, would it have taken me that long for any number of reasons? Hmm. So it's, it's, it's tough because, you know, people find themselves where they are in life in the present moment and they don't, they don't have the benefit. And, you know, it's, it's kind of too bad that you have to have the, the responsibility of looking back on history or, or having to contend with, you know, all this other stuff, all this other context that's gone before that you really didn't have a hand in shaping, but that's where everybody is. You know, everybody's got to bear some kind of the part of the burden of, of, of history, you know, and for a long time, it's been pretty much exclusively on the backs of people of color, of women, you know, disabled people, you name it, you know, and now, you know, that we, we, now that the, that imbalance has been recognized and the first steps in shifting it are being taken. Yeah. There's going to be some discomfort, you know, but you know, it's, it's, that is, that is just where the burden is falling right now. And hopefully, you know, the idea is that nobody has to, you know, getting to a place where nobody has to bear that because there is actually actual equity and an actual, uh, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, a situation where where we really truly do recognize that all voices are, are recognized. So it's practically it's really hard to say. It's like yeah, hire more hire more people. I'm a big believer in intern internships, mentoring. Uh, you know, I think all professionals, whenever possible, that they can reach out to someone who really needs it. You know, a lot of and a lot of times, yeah, it's going to be a person of color. It's going to be a woman. It's going to be, you know, a disabled person, uh, wherever that's possible to do, you know, do it. Good faith efforts, you know, uh, are, are like, you know, they're just that they're efforts in good faith to do, to do the right thing. Um, and I, I know there's a lot of like lots of different programs that people have access to now that didn't exist before. Those are all great. Uh, but I honestly think it's like, it really is an individual thing of like what's what's the good faith thing i can do if i actually do realize and accept that yeah there's an imbalance what can i do to help can i can i hire somebody maybe they don't have you know the greatest resume but you know what i talked to them i enter i went through the trouble of interviewing six several candidates i have a good feeling about this person i'm willing to do a little hand holding if it takes that and you know what a lot of times you take a chance on somebody and you don't need to hand hold them you know, or they're a much quicker, much hungrier uh, uh, study than than uh, you might have gotten otherwise. So it's it's sort of, you know, a lot of it is like uh, not letting your hesitation or uncertainty about even making an effort get the better of you before you even try. Yeah, I, I think all of that's uh, wonderful advice for anybody, whether you're the one that's trying to break in, not being recognized, or you're on my yep. end, which is that I've been on the receiving end of a lot of things being very beneficial for people that look m like me and have my gender. Yeah. And now all of a sudden that shifted and I have a multitude of people that have come to me um, that have said, listen, I've been really successful as an editor or a composer or director or whatever for 15, 20 years. And all of a sudden in the last two years, it's all disappeared. And I basically know it's because I'm a white male mm -hmm. and they're like I kind of get it it sucks but I'm starting to see rather than it being how dare they a lot of them are like it's kind of my time to, to deal with the struggle because I'm feeling the imbalance and that's the the burden I think a lot of us take is like when you had said that now you're seeing people that are like hey what about me you're hiring all the blacks and females mm -hmm. and Asians and what now what about me it's like yeah yeah well, how's that feel right yeah like, and, and that's and, the and, imbalance yeah. And it's and it's not even I mean, I hate that anybody ever feels like that, you know, and, and and it's like. But if you took a snapshot of the industry, even now, it's going to be like 95 percent, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, there's just there's just no, you know, as much as it seems to be in flux and as, as much as it seems to be changing now, it's still the you know, it's still like a vast imbalance. So it's I don't. You know, it's also I think the industry in general is just changing, you know, the economics of it, the, you know, streamers versus, you know, it's just the whole thing is is, is changing. So I, 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 I would hesitate to even say that, you know, I don't I, and I don't think that it's like I don't think, you know, 
uh, minority people, more minority people coming to the into the workforce is actually driving anybody out. I highly doubt it. I think it's it's a lot of it's an as as usual in politics and society. It's an easy target. Yeah, it's all you perception. Know, it's an, yeah, it's an easy thing that you know you can look at these market forces that are keeping you from getting the jobs maybe as easily as you used to get, as opposed to you know you know, oh my God, these new people are coming and pushing me out. And it's like, well, mm-hmm. is that true? Or, you know, Hollywood's never that kind of, you know, people as they start to get older, you know, new crops of people come in, they want their young, fresh faces and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, that's just as much of a thing as anything else. So it's, it's, but, you know, like you were saying, perception, you know, and it's, it's, uh, you just hope that, that you just hope that enough people can step back and go, well, you know, I, I think there, there, there's more going on than than uh, than than what there might seem to be, and yeah. you can't you can't you can't uh, you can't pin everything on on one problem or one solution. But you know, it's there. Just as long as people understand, yeah, there has historically been a thing that goes into into the pot with all these other complex things that influence the way the industry is going. Yeah, and the the way that I kind of want to bring this all together because I do want to be very very respectful of your time, of which you've been mm-hmm. very generous with. Ah, but I pleasure. think that the for, for Talk me, about me, of course, <laughs> yes, uh, for me the the most important argument to bring more diversity and culture into this industry, or frankly any industry, it's mm-hmm. a hard sell to say yeah. because it's the right thing to do. It right. is the right thing to do, but that's a hard sell. Right. Correct. It's another thing to say that it literally equals money at the box office. And in my mind, Spider-Verse is hard proof diversity of voices equals money and success. Because I would imagine it was mm-hmm. not easy as a quote unquote failed director in animation <laughs> to shop around an idea that's animated about Spider-Man in a black character universe. Well, luckily, I didn't have to. I mean, Spider Verse is is not as much as I'd love to take credit for a hundred percent of that movie. It was not generated by me. I I kind of like, I uh, I kind of lucked into being a part of it. The luck, once again, you know, luck. Um, uh, Spider Verse came about when uh, Bill Lord and Chris Miller, who uh, you know, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, Lego Movie, guys who kind of revolutionized feature. Uh, American feature animation in, in, in a couple of ways. Uh, they were approached by Sony to do an animated Spider-Man movie. And at first they turned it down because they've been kind of a glut of Spider-Man stuff. And then they turned back around and said, wait a minute, there's this character, Miles Morales, who's never been done, you know, in, in uh, movie form. And they said, if we can make the movie by Miles, we'll do it. So that was, that's, Phil and Chris had like the incredible, like, brainstorm to like bring this character to life and it like what it did was it took something that you were familiar with which was the idea of spider-man and it put a whole new spin on it but was also extremely respectful to the uh the character and the uh, the ethos of spider-man and that's what that's what made that movie such a you know groundbreaking thing was that it was it was one of the most spider-man movies ever but it was also a completely new take on who and what Spider-Man was. And uh, yeah, I lucked into being a part of it. There was a whole convoluted story to that too. But um, suffice it to say, uh, I ended. I, I actually ended up uh, as the second director on the team after my good friend Bob Persichetti, who I'd known from uh, DreamWorks, genius. And then Rodney Rothman came after me and uh, with uh, Phil and Chris producing and, and kind of like having the initial creative guidance uh, yeah, we all worked like dogs to make that movie happen. But um, it, what's the the importance I think of Spider Verse was showing that if you uh, took the idea of you know of of uh, an established legacy character and sort of put a new spin on it by by bringing in the idea of a diverse interpretation of that character, which the material lent itself to. It's all about li- like other universes where other things can happen so you can have other versions of these characters and they you know in spider-verse miles was able able to interact with peter parker who was the original spider-man so there's a dialogue between this new diverse interpretation and the 
than the, and the kind of the legacy interpretation that everyone knows and loves. And I think that made it a little easier for people to like, you know, uh, buy into this idea of diversity as an additive thing, not as a punitive or a replacement thing. You know what I mean? Because both ideas coexisted simultaneously and both Spider-Men were as much Spider-Man like a hundred percent as the original ever was. So it's kind of a nice metaphor, I think, for, you know, what that idea of, of diversity being uh, being given more space in the culture really can do. It can it can add more. It can deepen the understanding of of what what the legacy always has been, you know, because it's a it's a fresh it's an opportunity to look at something fresh from a whole new perspective. You know, it's like, look at, you know, I'd be another example. I could give the, uh, the example of Hamilton, you know, which is like a similar sort of like, you know, it sounds like a, you know, thinking, you know, it sounds like a completely ridiculous idea when you think of it on its face, a hip hop version of American history with an old, you know, a cast of like black and Latino Asian people. What, you know, it sounds, it sounds kind of silly, but then when you look and see what it, what reflecting things through that kind of mirror does and making the core ideas feel fresh and relevant again and relevant for everyone, you know, no matter what background you come from, that you, to me, that's what you can get from diversity and this idea that, well, everybody's reality is important. You know, you can, you, you know, a white person can learn as much from my background and my life as I as I can from theirs. And we can learn as much about our own lives by looking at the other person's life and background. I mean, in a way that we never would have dreamed possible. There are so many stories that are possible if, uh, you know, because of uh, more diversity opening up that does that don't just benefit, uh, you know, the member of the specific minority minority group or sex or whatever. It's also, you know, I, I think there's so much for white people to learn about, you know, the reality that they exist in that's effectively been kept from them. You know, there's a whole there's a whole view of the world that is as uh, real and as uh, potent for uh, people living uh, in white society that, you know, the rest of us have lived that they just haven't been allowed uh, entry to because that's the way society has been stratified. So I think that complex, it's, it's not just diversity of, of race or, or sexual orientation or whatever. It's literally diversity of uh, interpretation of the world and the reality that we live in. And I think that's beneficial for everybody. Yeah, I couldn't agree with that more. And I have one very quick final question. And if you got to mm -hmm. leave, I totally understand. No, 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 I'm but, all good. But get, given the value of your diversified voice and perspective and experience, I want you to take all of this hindsight and knowledge or lack thereof, because you still mm -hmm. don't know anything yet, uh, <laughs> but all of that. And I want you to time travel back and I yeah. want you to have a conversation with yourself when you're in high school thinking oh, wow. that movies fall out of the sky. Mm-hmm. At that period of time, what advice would you give yourself? Wow, I'd say uh, I'd probably say, okay, you're going to go to college in a couple of years. You're going to drop out after two. Just, just get the degree. <laughs> Learn a little more. Um, I think I would, I would have told myself, uh, uh, wow, what would I? You know, people have asked me this question before, and I'm, I'm trying to think of the, of, of I think I would have told myself, have a little more faith in yourself. You know, don't, you know, don't, uh, don't, don't let your doubts sort of steer your decision making or, or keep you from making a decision. That's probably, that's probably the number one thing I would have said, because I think some things could have happened faster for me or in slightly different ways. Had I, had I, you know, understood that, you know, no, you can, you can do some of this stuff. Just have a little more faith, have a little more, have a little more courage, you know, you can do it. Um, that is probably the number one thing I would have told myself. Have a little more faith. It's, you know, you can take the leap a little earlier than you think you can, or you can, you know, you can, uh, because once I did start taking those leaps later, I found that, oh yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. 
And I think that's probably what I would have said and just save myself a little agony and heartache and beating my head against the wall later on. I love it. I think that that is uh, absolutely wonderful advice. And for anybody that has the internet or IMDb or any website, they know where to find your work. But mm. if somebody wanted to find you personally, you strike me as the type that's willing to, to help others and mm -hmm. answer a question or two and shepherd them along the way. How do people find you personally? The easiest way probably is to reach out on Twitter. And honestly, you know, if, if people tweet me and, I, and, and uh, you know, I'm happy to, you know, generally happy to answer questions or whatever. And that's a pretty free flowing, you know, uh, free flowing forum, as everybody knows, for, for, for good and for ill. But uh, that's <laughs> probably the way P Ramsey 342 on Twitter. And uh, yeah, I, I, mean, I try to I try to do I try to do things like this, you know, podcasts and or, or uh, interviews or educational uh you know, I'm, I'm really big on uh, uh, educational, uh, you know, forums or whatever. I, I always love to contribute to stuff like that. So I'm always down for, for those uh, discussions or or uh, or talks. But, uh, yeah, if anybody, you know, was watching and they were like, wow, I really would like to ask him about this. Try Twitter. And, you know, nine times out of ten, you know, I'll go like, oh, this is what I think. Blah, 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 blah. I love it. I uh, really appreciate people that are open and willing to communicate with others and help them along their journeys. We'll make sure to put a link to uh, your Twitter page in the show notes. Uh, but otherwise, Peter, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here. Uh, I've learned a lot. I'm inspired as hell right now to go out and do some good <laughs> in the world. So can't thank you enough for your time and your expertise. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. And a uh, shout out to Debbie Germino for uh, recommending me for the conversation. It was really fun. So thanks. It's been a pleasure.